so good to um to feel the the benefits of practice and the benefits of the discipline of practice it's good to be returning to this for a third day in a row um, I'm inspired and grateful by the continuity of practice that IJS and all of you as a community of practitioners have sustained for years now and the container that allows us to step in together. So, yeah, so I arrive here really grateful. For those who are just joining as a point of visual access, my name is Rabbi Ari Lev. I use he and they pronouns, and I'm a white trans person with dark, short, curly hair and I'm wearing wire uh, plastic glasses today, a red sweatshirt, and I'm joining you from my office sitting in front of a bookshelf and here on unceded Lenny Lenape land in West Philadelphia. And we are working together with difficult emotions and sensations. We're working with, uh, with that which is painful. I want to invite you as we begin today to settle into the body. Based on a request from yesterday, I won't be ringing a bell at the end of our sit. I know that can pose some both sensory and technological challenges. So uh, if you're holding a wonder or an anticipation, uh, we'll end together with a collective bow, but with no bell. So I invite you to take your eyes and Lower your gaze or close your eyes entirely. Turn your attention towards the physicality of the body. The experience of sitting or reclining. <coughs> Excuse me. Sensations of contact where the body meets the ground or the chair. The sensations of the breath and the rise and fall of the stomach. I invite you to slow your breath as much as you can such that your inhale is as slow as you can imagine, and your exhale is even slower. For me right now, it looks like I'm counting to three on my inhale and about eight on my exhale, just to ensure that there is a a discipline within the body to slow the breath and elongate the exhale. Begin with a body scan, finding our sensation of our toes wiggling, perhaps inside of our socks or our shoes. Feeling the sensation, the pressure, the contact between our foot and the floor. Remembering that underneath the floor is the earth, that we are deeply supported, that we are held by this earth, allowing our awareness to journey through our ankles and up our calves, noticing any sensations, positive, negative, neutral, 
Everything is welcome. Nothing is a problem necessarily. There is no better way that your body could feel. Turning our attention towards our knees, these sites of movement and transition. You can find their stiffness and ease. Turning our attention towards our thighs. Up towards our hips, our torso. Rolling back our shoulders. Allowing our spine as we're able to have a slight arch in the lower back. Offering gratitude to our hands and our wrists and our elbows. Softening our necks. Wiggling out the jaw. Scrunching up your entire face into a little ball. And then letting it go. Relaxing your eyelids, your cheekbones. Dropping your jaw. And entering a posture that is easeful and awake. We're going to stay today with last week's Torah portion, Parshat Vayishlach. In which we find ourselves like Jacob wrestling with, wrestling with some figure, wrestling with ourselves, wrestling with our own experience. And when we're working with difficult sensations and difficult feelings, specifically, I want to talk about pain, which could be emotional pain or physical pain. I want to share my understanding of suffering through the teachings of the Buddha. I'm taught that suffering is reality plus resistance. Suffering is reality plus resistance. Which is to say, if our reality is that we are angry or that our hips are hurting, It is possible, the Buddha teaches us, to meet those difficult sensations or difficult emotions with grace and acceptance. And when we do that, we actually don't have to suffer. Pain or angst or anguish even things that we would identify in the Vedna of a negative sensation, um, we can be with them. We can come to know their contours without judging them and without resisting them, without trying to change them. And there's freedom in that. And it's so difficult not just having the emotion that's difficult, but being with the difficult emotion is in and of itself difficult. It's a practice, it's a skill we can build. And it's one of the core skills that I'm trying to build in my own practice, which is why I wanted to focus on it together for this week, because I've learned that my capacity to be with pain in the body and pain in the heart is directly linked to my capacity to experience joy to be happy. The poet Khalil Gibran says, your joy is your sorrow unmasked. The deeper the sorrow carves in us, the greater our capacity for joy. 
I think it's not just sorrow that he's describing. I think he's describing suffering more generally. So we can imagine that when Jacob is wrestling with the angel, unwilling to let him go, and um, the angel, this creature, this this other other emotional side of Jacob says, let me go. And Jacob says, not until you bless me. And the angel says, I'll bless you. Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but it shall be Yisrael. For you struggled with beings divine and human and prevailed. So our namesake as a people and as a tradition is, is born in struggle but it's actually born in the release of struggle. It's actually born of the spiritual practice of letting go of our struggles. And I think that's a key distinction. That it's possible to let go of our resistance. You could call the relationship that, that Jacob has when he's wrestling resistance to his reality and his release of it brings blessing and ease allows him to know himself differently, to rename himself. The same as possible is true for us. It's possible to let go of our resistance to discomfort. I'm gonna share a few techniques that make that possible. The two aspects in my own practice that have most made it possible to be with discomfort, whether it's physical or emotional, are compassion and curiosity. And they function slightly differently. So in my own body, in my own practice, when I'm working with the breath as an anchor and the rise and fall of the stomach, just noting up, down, up, down. And if a pain in my hip arises, pulls my attention, pulls my awareness towards it, I can notice my first instinct is I need to move. I need to get away from this pain. I need to make the pain go away. And if there's enough awareness, enough concentration present, I can notice the instinct to avoid, but not actually move. And then once I've actually allowed the pain to be there without reacting to it, I have two choices. Just first noticing how amazing it is to have choices when we're in pain. The first choice is to have compassion and say, This is difficult. It's difficult to be with this pain. Perhaps to offer myself some metta, may I be well. May I feel cared for. The second choice is curiosity. To approach the pain and notice, you know, what's its temperature? Is it hot or cold? What's its movement? Is it still or pulsing or vibrating? What's its weight? Is it light or heavy? Does it have a color? Is it red or black or yellow? Does it have a name? Does it have an animal or a face? I can come to know it with a kind of curiosity that can almost make me want to be with it because I have so many questions about it. And the pain is still there. And when the pain is too great, I'll I'll titrate, I'll turn my attention back to my anchor and stay with the breath. And then when my attention is pulled, I might say, oh, pain, I see you there again. And then back to my anchor. This can work for both an overwhelming physical sensation and an overwhelming emotional sensation.
This can also work for positive or neutral feeling tones. So a kind of compassion and curiosity is not isolated to the negative, but I think it's um, the negative sensations most obscures how we might begin to work with it. So I invite you to experiment with that in your practice today. To connect to your anchor and then know what else arises and then return to your anchor. Rise and fall of the stomach. Sensation of air on the upper lip. The hum of the heat. And we come close to the pain, to the anger, to the anguish. We notice that it's not static, that it almost, almost can disappear or change forms. That it's alive, that it, it also is impermanent. And this can be a comfort to the mind to remember even the worst pain is temporary. It can also encourage us, give us courage to be with the pain if we know that it won't last forever.
can also notice when we turn towards a pain or an itch, just as we turn towards it, a new thing arises that would have our attention, a new pain, a new itch, new discomfort. When we turn towards sadness, then we notice Frustration can arise. Just to say the sensations of the body and the feelings of the heart, they're all the activity, all a normal part of being human, but we can develop the discipline, the gvura, the practice of staying connected to our anchor, even in the midst of difficult emotions and difficult sensations and the distractions of the physical body and of the mind.
some part of our experience can appear or reveal itself almost like a kaleidoscope. Contraction in the eyebrows, an itch under the lip, mild discomfort in the lower back. It's all present and changing and part of it. The eyelids can soften, the itch disappears. Tingle above the eyelid. A neutral sensation of my thumbs touching. We return to the breath. Rise and fall of the stomach. Counting as we inhale and counting even longer as we exhale.
the words of the poet Rumi. If God said, Rumi, pay homage to everything that has helped you enter my arms. There would be not one experience of my life, not one thought, not one feeling, not one act I would not bow to. Pay homage to everything that has helped you enter my arms. The wholeness of your experience, the fullness of it, its pain, its suffering, its resistance, its joy, its love, its anticipation. Every, every experience, every thought, every act is worth bowing to. Thank you for your practice. Turn it over to Rebecca for Mourner's Scottish. Thank you so much for that beautiful practice, our love. We seal our practice offering an opportunity for any of you who are in mourning or observing your site, remembering someone who has passed, or if it is your practice to participate in the Mourner's Kaddish, to do so now. If you are not reciting the Kaddish, you're invited to stay present and offer your compassion and love to those who are in mourning. If you are observing Kaddish, I welcome you to put the names of anyone who you are remembering into the chat. Kat will share the words of Kaddish on the screen. And if you are reciting Kaddish, I invite you to unmute yourself and to join me uh, rising in body or spirit to recite these words together. Yes, Thank you again, Rabbi Ari Lev, for that beautiful teaching. Before we close, uh, Kat will share again in the chat box the link to our website, where if you're able and so moved, you can make a donation in support of our work at IJS. We are so grateful for your support, and we are grateful to all of you for helping to create this beautiful community of practice every day. For those who are leaving now, we wish you good health and shalom as you move into the rest of your day. And hope to see you again tomorrow and the rest of this week for the rest of this beautiful series with Rabbi Ari Lev at the same time. And those of you who would like to are welcome to stay on here to ask Ari Lev any questions or to share your reflection on today's meditation experience. So if you have questions, you're welcome to share them in the chat and we'll stay on for a little while longer to uh, hear a little bit more from Rabbi Ari Lev on some of the themes from today's practice. So, um, also want to add, somebody asked, where's Mark? <laughs> Mark had an engagement today, so that's why I'm hosting for today, but he will be back tomorrow and for the rest of the week. So, um, I love, we have a question here from Laura in the chat. She asks, 
and meditation, would you offer specific suggestions as to how to bring curiosity to suffering or pain when it seems to be caused by the actions of another person? Will you hold that question for one second, Rebecca? Absolutely. Yeah. Only in that I received a question during the sit that was instructional and I want to get to that and then, uh, and then respond to your question. Someone asked during the sit to me uh, individually, I saw what's an anchor and how do I return to it? And I want to make sure um, I didn't go into the anchor today. So uh, Jonathan, I apologize for that. It's something I had spent time explaining on Monday and Tuesday and not take for granted, but sort of emerged uh, to move us forward. So an anchor is a tool we use in this particular uh, lineage of Vipassana meditation to develop concentration and awareness. And it's a place we decide to settle our awareness. Anchor suggests that it's heavy or weighted, but actually it's something much more like waving in a crowd to a beloved friend, right? It has a lightness. Uh, It's like you're touching cotton balls almost. Um, And so I had offered that there's three kinds of anchors that we could use. One is the sensation of hearing, which has the benefit of being external to the body and a bit expansive, but can also be a bit um, intangible and hard to connect to for people. So some people it's easier, some people it's more difficult. The second anchor is the sensation of, of contact, of physical contact. So it could be your, your tush on your seat, you know, noting touch, touch, or it could be your hands uh, clasp, and you could notice the sensation of your hands touching. And the third, and I would say the most common anchor is the sensation of the breath. And in your own body, you can decide which sensation of the breath you most connect to or most easily can place your awareness. For me, it's the rise and fall of the stomach, noting the up and the down, rising, falling. And so when the mind wanders, which it does, we do an act of chuva, an act of returning and When we awaken and realize the mind has wandered, we can return our attention to the the anchor, to the experience of the anchor. Uh, And so whenever our attention is pulled elsewhere, when we realize that, we can then return it um, to the anchor. So that's how the anchor works. Rebecca, I'll take your question now. Yeah, there's a lot of good questions now here in the chat. The first one from Laura was just in meditation, would you offer specific suggestions as to how to bring curiosity to suffering or pain when it seems to be caused by the actions of another person? Mm -hmm. You want to speak on that a little bit? Yeah. So the first thing is that it's difficult. It's so difficult to work with the difficult sensations when it's relational and when you feel it's caused by someone else. Um, The primary way that I work with that is actually not through this uh, traditional Vipassana meditation, but through another lineage within this tradition called Metta, which is a kind of loving kindness practice. And so when I find a lot of um, overwhelming emotion dealing with, with conflict with someone or harm or hurt, I'll often begin by sort of just uh, softening the horizon of the heart and just, you know, saying to myself, like, may I be well may I be cared for, may I have what I need in this world, and just offering myself some blessings of metta, of loving kindness. And um, that softening and that care allows me to then open um, to the sort of care and compassion I might want to feel for for another person. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, one of the beautiful opportunities in our practice to actually have that kind of spaciousness to just focus on ourselves and our own experiences regardless of the cause, right? Of what might have arisen there. And then um, there can be so much more wisdom and skillfulness that we can then bring into the relational when we're ready, right? Which might might really take a while. And and that question makes me think perhaps how we'll end the week on Friday is with some instruction around metta. We can do a specific metta meditation, which could be a nice way to enter Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. So um, one question that I, that kind of came up for me that I was curious to hear you speak on a little bit, I love is, um, you know, as you said so beautifully, there can be so much, so much healing as possible when we can soften and turn towards um, unpleasant sensations or feelings with curiosity and compassion. But um, I know that sometimes also challenging sensations or feelings can really be overwhelming actually. And I wonder if you could speak on, is there actually 
um, a certain caliber of discomfort or unpleasant feelings or sensations where you would not recommend the practice of turning towards with curiosity and compassion? How do you make that discernment? Um, and what might you do, you know, in that case, if, if something actually is too strong to be with? with yeah, my great, great question. Um, so in, in that circumstances, when the feeling or the sensation is overwhelming, which is so common and so human and part of my own experience as well, um, I use a technique called titrating. Um, I think it's like a, I think it's actually a medical term that people use. So you might know it um, when you think about an IV line, an intravenous line uh, that's sending medicine or fluids into the body, you can adjust how fast the drip is. Mm -hmm. And that's called titrating. You can titrate the drip. You want it to be, you know, 10 drips a minute or hundred drips a minute. Um, and you're sort of like, how much, how much is getting in at a given time? And so my teachers have taught me, you can titrate uh, when you're working with a very uh, big emotion or sensation, you can titrate your awareness. And what that looks like is um, I'm staying with my anchor. My attention gets pulled towards the very uncomfortable feeling in my knee. Okay. And I go there. And as soon as I go there, I just lose all concentration and I start wiggling. That tells me, okay, this is a bigger, bigger sensation. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my anchor. I'm going to, you know, develop concentration and then become aware again of the knee, turn towards the knee and say, oh, pain in the knee. And then I'm going to turn myself back towards my anchor. So what you're doing is you're like touching into it and then you're turning away. You might touch into it one day, that's big. And you might say, okay, actually I'm going to, I'm aware of that, but it's not what I'm going to anchor my practice on. But if you were working with it, you would, you would titrate and maybe you would touch into it and say, okay, I'm um, pain in the knee noting pain in the knee, noting heat. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to my anchor. And you can do this for an emotion or you can do it for sensation or, or a feeling. Um, so anger can be so overwhelming. It can be radiating and heat and I can lose all my concentration. So I might touch into anger in the heart, but then I might also turn my attention towards maybe my knee's not hurting. So it's like neutrality in the knee can be a way to recenter and then come back to the breath. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. We have a few other questions here. Um, from Lester, I invariably find myself collapsing, my head drooping, my spine rounding forward. Yesterday, mm -hmm. you spoke about not scratching the itch or fixing. Do you recommend I upright myself if I notice that I'm right, mm -hmm. moving, leaning forward in my posture or just notice and continue that rounding and drooping? Mm -hmm. So that's very common. It's, um, you know, sleepiness is, is one of the five, you know, obstacles to meditation. It's the Buddha writes about it. So it's a very human experience. It's very common to become sleepy when meditating. It, the first thing to note is like, oh, that's an experience that can also pass. It doesn't mean you'll always be sleepy or you'll always droop. And the most important thing is just the, is the, is the choice there. So to notice like, okay, I'm drooping. And then, then it's to decide like, Okay, you know, that you are you going to finish the sit like this or are you going to say like moving, moving? What you want to be mindful is it's not inherently a problem to move, but there's a difference between just moving and moving with awareness. So it's like there's a difference between like I have an itch here and then an itch here and then an itch here versus um okay, I've I've readjusted but now I'm going to re-enter and I'm not going to sort of just attend to the next pain that arises. So there's a way to move with mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And at times I'll do that, you know, cause you don't want to over, mm -hmm. what you don't want to do is be like, I'm stuck in this droopy posture and it's hurting my back. And I'm literally, my head is falling down and I'm falling asleep, but I can't move. You know, then we get into a constricted place and we want to be much more in a cotton ball place. Uh, so have a lightness. So sometimes moving can be skillful. Thank you. Yeah. And I think you're really hitting on the difference between responding and reacting, right? It's like, is that movement just immediate and habitual or actually is there spaciousness to be with it and then choose what might be skillful, what might be a loving response that comes from that softer place. And that's, that's really connected to Lori. Lori Fisher asked a question that's quite similar. She says, while I understand and respect the guidance to not move when the body indicates pain, I'm a bit resistant to this, resistant to this instruction as someone who frozen, disassociated, um, during 
perhaps painful past experiences, I now feel that respecting the sensation of pain and making a slight body adjustment to the pain sin- signal is more supportive of my body, soul, and practice, allowing that pain to feel seen and dissolve, and then to move on to my anchor with more relief. So she's curious if you could share more thoughts on that, on, on that choice of perhaps moving if there's pain. Yeah, Lori, I think you are the expert of your own practice, right? You are, you, you know, your body best, you know, your practice best, you know, what mindfulness will feel like for you and your life and your body. And um, certainly all of the conditions that we arrive with, including the conditions of being survivors of pain and abuse will um, inform how we approach our practice. And so I think it sounds like it could be skillful uh, to move in pain. And it, it can be skillful if we also find ourselves kind of like grinning and bearing it, even if we're not in that circumstance. Um, but th- there's a difference between that and um, and moving at every moment of discomfort, which is more how I've been habituated and how many of us have been. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And there are so many ways also to work mindfully with painful emotions and sensations. And I know for, for me, um, movement practices, yoga, dance, walking, running, those can also be extremely supportive of seated practice. So different kinds of practices can really complement one another. Mm. Um, Lillian asked, you know what? I'm sorry, Rebecca, I think we're out of for today, but we'll, uh, okay, great. We can, uh, we'll continue tomorrow. We'll continue tomorrow. Well, again, Rabbi Arlev, thank you so much for joining us for this beautiful practice and teaching and really encourage everyone to come tomorrow and Friday um, to continue with us in this series. So thank you and hope everyone has a wonderful day. Many blessings.